All right, so this is the third lecture for chapter three, and in this chapter we're going to talk about the mechanics of respiration. So first let's talk about the dimensions of the thoracic cage. There's two apertures. There's the superior aperture, which is shown here, and then the inferior aperture, which is shown uh, in this region right here. And what they do is there are openings uh, in the thoracic cage that serve as passageways for structures into and out of the cage. So superior would be for structures coming in and out of the neck into the thorax, and then the inferior aperture would be for structures coming in and out of the thoracic cage from the abdomen. So the superior thoracic uh, aperture, the borders, this is commonly a test question for anatomy exams, is you have the T1 vertebrae, which is shown right here. So this is your T1 vertebrae. Then you have the first ribs, which is shown right here. So rib one, rib one on this side. Then you have the manubrium, which is this bone right here, this part of the sternum. And then that's, that's completed. I mean, it's just one circle here, vertebrae, rib, and then manubrium. And one thing to note is that the clavicle is not part of the borders here. It's not considered. And that's commonly a tr trick question on anatomy exams. So just be aware of that. So then you have the inferior thoracic aperture, which uh, you first the borders start here with the xiphoid process, uh, which is just the inferior portion of the sternum. Then you have the costal margin, which is formed by this border formed by the false ribs. And then you have ribs 11 and 12. And then you come down here to the T12 uh, vertebrae. So that's your your borders right there of the inferior thoracic aperture and there's the outline of it. The thoracic cage it has three axes on which it moves. So first you have the vertical axis which is just superior and inferior so it moves along this way and and when I say move it like the the not the cage itself and then also the intrathoracic volume which would be the the space within here that can uh, helps drive breathing the pressure gradients. And so this is mainly driven by the diaphragm going up and down, up and down, as we talked about. Then you have the anterior, uh, posterior axis, which would be kind of into the into the page here or into the screen. So you have you know anterior and then posterior. So that uh, axis as well, moving back to front. And then you have the transverse axis, which is uh, from side to side here. Okay, it's the horizontal axis. All right, so here we'll talk about ventilation. Ventilation, by definition, is movement of air into and out of the lungs. So if we draw our lungs here, this would be inspiration in, expiration out. Then inspiration, it's driven by movement of the thoracic cage along the three axes mentioned. So along this vertical axis, this horizontal axis, and then the AP uh, axis. So the thoracic cage expands along those axes, and what it does is 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 it produces a negative air pressure in the lungs because by doing that it increases the intrathoracic volume and then when you if you remember uh, from physics pressure and volume are inversely re related so if you increase the volume you're going to decrease the pressure by decreasing the pressure you create the concept of negative air pressure in the lungs which then drives air movement into the respiratory tract because if you have negative pressure in here and you have one atmosphere of pressure out here there's a gradient and that drives the air into the lungs the thoracic cage, it has two motions which drive inspiration uh, of the cage itself. This is outside of the movement of the diaphragm. This is, we're talking about strictly movement of the cage. You have the pump handle movement and the bucket handle movement. So the pump handle movement is where you think of the sternum as the handle of a pump like this. And then you have the ribs articulating this that completes the other part of the pump. And what happens is, is you have is it's thought of as that you would you're almost reaching out there and grabbing the sternum with your hand and pulling it out anteriorly and so what happens is is during inspiration the, the handle of the pump pulls the thoracic cage anterior to expand the thoracic volume along the anterior posterior axis because if you're going to move out this way if you're going to pull the cage out this way you're going to increase the, the cage along this anterior posterior axis now the bucket handle, this is looking at a transverse view. So here's your vertebrae, here's your ribs coming out here, here's your sternum here. And so what's thought of as here is that the ribbon in its entirety, so all of this is thought of as the handle of a bucket. So if you know if you remember a bucket like this, and you have a you know a handle like this, th this entire structure is thought of as the rib. Okay, and they show you in these dotted lines the movement. And so the ribs articulating points is this is thought of as the one hand part of the bucket here, the, the vertebrae. And then this, the sternum here is thought of as the other articulating point of the, of the bucket handle on the bucket. Okay, so the bucket could be thought of as almost the thoracic, thoracic cage itself or the thoracic volume. This would be the bucket here, and then here's the handle. So what happens is, is that 
is that the rib moves outward or laterally like this along these dotted lines, and it increases the volume of the thoracic cage along this transverse axis, okay? So it's important to note, so bucket handle movement moves it along the transverse axis, and then the pump handle movement moves the thoracic cage along the anterior posterior axis. So let's talk about, now that we've got the axis down, let's talk about quiet breathing. Quiet inspiration is where the diaphragm contracts and drops inferiorly to increase the volume of the thoracic cage along the vertical axis. So you have the vertical axis here. You have the diaphragm, which again is that dome-shaped muscle that we talked about in the previous lecture. The diaphragm contracts. So the diaphragm originally looks like this. It contracts and then it flattens out like this. By doing that, you're, mo you're increasing the volume of the thoracic cage along the vertical axis like this. So that's quiet inspiration. Quiet expiration is passively is passive and it's solely driven by the recoil of the elastic fibers in the lung tissue. So there's no movement along the axis here. There's no muscle contraction here. It's it's purely a passive process. And so what happens here is you have the lungs that expand. So the alveoli or the, the air pockets in the lungs expand during inspiration. And then during expiration, you have this elastic tissue out here in the in the tissue of the lungs they contract down on this enclosed space it decreases the volume which increases the pressure the pressure is then inside the lungs is greater than the pressure in the atmosphere and that pressure gradient drives the pressure from the area of high pressure in the lungs to the lower pressure out in the atmosphere and that is what drives quiet expiration so again just to go with this table it's in your book quiet inspiration like we said is driven along the vertical axis, and then quiet expiration is driven down the vertical axis as well. All right, so during active inspiration, the muscles of the thoracic cage are, tr are trying to work with the diaphragm to maximally increase the volume in the thoracic cage. And the way they do that is, is the muscles help the thoracic cage carry out the pump handle and the bucket handle movements. And these movements, they don't act in isolation. They are working together. And in fact, they're working simultaneously with the diaphragm to help maximally increase the volume of the thoracic cage along the vertical, the transverse, and the anterior posterior axes. So it's moving along all three axes at once. And again, the idea is, is to maximally increase it. So you have the diaphragm, which is flattening out and increasing along the vertical axis. You have the bucket handle, which is going out like this laterally to help increase along the transverse axis. And then you have the pump handle, which is coming out this way to increase it along the anterior posterior axis and the idea there is is the more you increase the uh, the volume if you remember pressure volume like we talked about inversely related the more you increase the volume the more you're going to decrease the pressure the more you decrease the pressure in the thoracic cage and then in the lungs the greater the pressure gradient between the atmospheric pressure in the lungs and so if the more you make this uh, the more you decrease the pressure the more air you're going to be able to drive in because the gradient's going to be stronger. So active expiration, it's the same kind of concepts, this pressure volume, but a little more complicated. So what happens is, is when you're having active expiration, when you're trying to blow out as much air as possible, not just you know let the elastic recoil in the lungs take care of it, you're trying to exhale as much as possible, what happens is you'll notice is that your abdominal muscles will contract, and what they will do is decrease the volume of the abdominal cavity. So you see that here in the diagram. So this would be the abdominal cavity, the thoracic cavity here. You, in de in, you de By decreasing the volume of the abdominal cavity by having this contraction from all the way around, you're maximally increasing the pressure in the abdominal cavity. When you increase the pressure in the abdom abdominal cavity, pressure's got to go somewhere, so it's going to push up on the diaphragm. And what's going to help is going to, it's going to help the diaphragm push up into the thoracic cavity and decrease the, the volume of the thoracic cavity along this uh, vertical axis here. And by pushing up and decreasing that volume in the thoracic cavity, you're going to further increase the pressure because the idea is to increase the pressure as much as possible in the thoracic cavity to make it greater than the atmospheric pressure because if this is greater than that, then you're going to have a great, a very large gradient to drive the, the air out of the lungs. The whole idea here with breathing, inspiration, expiration, whether it's active, passive, is you're trying to create that pressure gradient. Because you remember, air moves from high pressure to low pressure. Same thing in the, in the circulation. Blood is going to move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. The arteries are high pressure. The veins are low pressure. Same concept here. So by contracting the abdomen, 
you're almost in a way indirectly helping increase the pressure in the thoracic cavity, which then helps push air out of the lungs. We're going to talk about a little uh, clinical coral here, the flail chest. This is a medical emergency, and it occurs when there's multiple adjacent broken ribs. So you could have this rib broken, this rib broken, and this rib broken. Could be, you know, just two. It could be five ribs. We'll just have three or four here. And it causes really this whole segment. So this whole segment here of the thoracic cage causes this segment to move independently during respiration. So this segment, since it's broken, it's not going to move in unison with the rest of the thoracic cage. It's going to move independent of that. So what happens is, is it's unsupported, and it actually moves paradoxically during inspiration. So what's important to note is that it, on inspiration, where you'd want the thoracic cage to move outward, you want the ribs to move outward, this segment's actually going to move inward. So it's going to move inward, which is uh, not what you would want because it's going to actually de decrease the volume versus coming out and expanding it. And then on expiration, it's actually going to move outward like this on expiration okay and it almost follows the the the, the it's not it's not a freely moving uh structure what happens is it's, is it's subject to influence by the pressure within the thoracic cavity so and that makes sense is you know it's going to move inward on inspiration because the pressure is lower on inspiration you have lower pressure so there's nothing pushing out on this so it's going to just in a sense fall into the thoracic into the thorax and versus on out on expiration you're increasing the pressure within the thoracic cavity so it's going to push them outward so that makes so that's the signature sign of flail chest is paradoxical movement of the affected area during respiration this is often seen in victims of uh, motor vehicle accidents you know trauma to the chest wall um, common symptoms are ch uh, severe chest pain. I mean, if you have multiple broken ribs, you can imagine that's a very painful thing. Shortness of breath, because since you're having paradoxical movement of this segment, it, it cuts down on the efficiency of the thoracic cage movement and hence the breathing. So they're going to have uh, shortness of breath because they're just not breathing as efficiently as, as a normal person. What the treatment involves is often intubation because they're having trouble breathing on their own. You're going to, or you could do positive pressure ventilation, um, Chest tubes may be involved if you know, especially if there's a pneumothorax. You want to drain air out of the, out of this region. You want to do pain control because making air breather. Because for these people, it, it hurts to breathe, and so you want to give them pain medicine to help them breathe more. And then sometimes it, it can involve surgical fixation of the ribs if it's a very severe uh, fracture or it's in danger of injuring vital structures in the body. And that concludes our discussion of the mechanics of respiration.